exemplifies something that we all care very much about, and, and that is human milk as a source of both nutrition and defensive molecules for, for the baby. What we have done is to identify an individual molecule and take that molecule from the discovery phase through all the work that it takes to characterize it and understand what it does into a phase of drug development. And to us, if we were successful in proving that a molecule from human milk would actually be able to be used, not only for the benefit of the baby, but also to treat patients with different illnesses, that would in a way be the ultimate proof of the power of, of human milk. Not that, not that it needs to be proven, every baby uh, benefits from the contents of human milk, and that's really where our work started. We were looking for natural antibiotics. So trying to prevent bacteria, bacteria that cause pneumonia, from sticking to lung tissue. And in doing that we tried different components of blood and tears and milk and so on. And suddenly, when we used a certain fraction of human milk, the, the cells in the test tube died. And these were, these were cancer cells for practical reasons, not deliberately. And so we had a serendipitous observation showing that a molecule in human milk was killing cancer cells. And that's when the hunt started, the hunt for the molecule and the hunt for why the tumor cells are dying. It, it turned out that there was a high degree of selectivity. So tumor cells were dying more than normal cells. And we tested a large variant variety of, of tumor cells from different tissues and individuals and so on. And the carcinoma cells all died with similar characteristics. When we tested healthy differentiated cells, mature cells from tissues, they were not dying and embryonal cells were in between. So suggesting that this component from milk is somehow identifying a characteristic in tumor cells that, of course, is very interesting to understand and, and to, to benefit from. Because what do we want to do in cancer? We want to kill the cancer cells. And we want to avoid killing the healthy cells. This has always been the enigma, hasn't it? We all have relatives who are treated with cytostatic drugs and irradiation and who, who suffer almost more from the treatment than they do from their actual disease, their actual illness. You can say that while you're treating the cancer, you're almost killing the patient. And this is accepted, in a sense, as the norm. I don't know why we and, and all the patients do accept this, why there is not, not a big demand for cancer therapies with less side effects. There are some emerging advances from different groups in the world in this field. And Hamlet is an example of a molecule that can kill tumor cells without being overtly toxic. Um, so one of the things that we have been doing is to really test this concept of killing tumor cells and not being toxic for healthy tissue in a variety of cancer models, in animals and in patients. So the animal models that we have used are brain tumors, which of course are highly malignant and difficult to treat today. And in, in the brain tumors, if you pump Hamlet into the brain, you can see that the tumor development is, is markedly reduced, significantly reduced. We've also tested colon cancer, colon cancer models, which in mice are quite good because the mice resemble humans in that they have the same mutations as the human patients do. And so a mouse model can tell us something relevant about the human disease. And if we feed animals with these mutations, with Hamlet through the mouth, over a 10-day period, we can reduce tumor development by 60%. We can also prevent in this model, in baby babies, almost like breastfeeding, um, if we add Hamlet after they are waned, after the pups stop breastfeeding their mothers and keep Hamlet coming in for 10 weeks, we can also reduce the development of cancer in these mice by about 60%.
And the third animal model that we've used is bladder cancer. Um, there is a routine in patients with bladder cancer that you inject the drugs into the bladder directly. And there are some successful therapies that are used that way. So we thought, why can't we just inject Hamlet into, into the bladder and see if it works? And, and uh, we can really limit the progression of the tumour in mice. We've also performed two human studies. Uh, one of them is actually bladder cancer. So in patients with bladder cancer, we were just going to find out if, if the tumour cells died after we injected Hamlet into the bladder. And lo and behold, what we saw was rapid excretion of tumour cells into the urine. And those tumour cells had signs of dying um, and, and the mechanism of death was apoptosis, which is a beneficial mechanism. So we are now focused on developing further, um, not just studies, but to develop Hamlet into a real pharmaceutical. And this is work that is quite advanced for a small academic unit like ours. We've had commercial support and we have had very good consultants doing this. So where we are now is that we've been able to uh, find a piece of Hamlet that we can make synthetically. And we've made large quantities with the help of a factory in Strasbourg and we have GMP certificates that this is a real drug quality product. We have also been able to take it and develop it all the way into little bottles for individual patients and they're sitting in the freezer ready to go. In the meantime we've also had wonderful help to test, do real toxicity testing, you know, in a factory that does nothing but this, where different animals were exposed to Hamlet and we got very good news from this professional group saying that they found no evidence of toxicity in healthy animals. We've also been able to obtain ethical permission and uh, uh, very close to starting um, the actual clinical trial with the second generation pharma grade version of Hamlet and this will be in patients with bladder cancer. So lots of excitement, lots of work and uh, we're of course hoping for all the patients out there that this will be successful but we have to wait and see. Well, one important question here is, is how this kind of process actually happens because it's unusual to take a scientific finding from an academic lab all the way into clinical trials and I would really like to emphasize that this has only been made possible by the composition of the team. There's been a number of people working with the Hamlet Project throughout the years and they've all contributed with passion and competence and with their time to the development of the project. Also, since we got extra funding, we have been able to interact with consultants that are absolute experts in the field, consultants with experience of drug development that we, that we do not have, of course, in an academic lab. And with this virtual network of different competencies, it's actually been possible to take the, the development as far as, as we are now. So I'd like to thank all the people involved throughout the years for their, for their work and their commitment. Thank you.